And so uh, I'm sure we'll have people that are continuing to join and that's great, but um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank everybody who is here and uh, looking forward to having a wonderful conversation with everybody. And um, in order to just sort of get us started off, I thought, um, if, George, would you like to pray for us? Yes, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord and have him join us, in fact, lead us. Father God, we thank you for the technology we have now that we can reach out to Hong Kong and, and Scotland and any other uh, state and country represented uh, with this group coming today. Lord, we thank you for uh, the ministry you called us to and for the many blessings that you have showered upon us that we don't deserve. We thank you for your grace and, uh, and for the power of your Holy Spirit working in us and through us. So now we give you this time together. You may be challenging us and inspiring us and motivating us for good works. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, unlike uh, a lot of our uh, other roundtables, uh, this time we don't have a presentation prepared for you. So really, uh, we're just, we would love to know if you all have any questions or things that are on your heart, things that you wanted to discuss about ministry, uh, horizons, other trends that you're seeing. Uh, around the world, um, wherever you are, and just yeah, give give a chance to just uh, be in relationship with you all, uh, even though we're de uh, separated by by a lot of distance. So if anybody has questions, feel free to just open up your microphone and just speak. I think if we can, as much as possible, when you're not speaking, have it muted, then that will kind of you know eliminate distractions and background noise. But feel free anytime you want to just. Open up your microphone and uh, and ask a question. Um, you, may or read, just... you may have read something in the newsletter you want more info about, or any questions that we may have not have covered in our newsletters. Yep. So you can also feel free to to chat. You know, type into the chat. Good uh, question. But yeah, go ahead, Steve. George. Yes. Pierre, what are you finding as far as the worldwide? Uh, COVID-19 epidemic, is it, do you see it up in certain places and down in certain places? Can you give us some kind of summary? I have not been up on the news about what's going on with COVID, but I know COVID has been used by God to, um, to get many people to come face to face with, uh, with the meaning of life and, and death. And so the uh, numbers of, uh, conversions and people seeking the Lord and seeking to know more about the Lord has more than tripled in the last two years. And that's the only thing I can tell you for sure. As far as numbers of COVID, I don't know. Some places it's gone down, some places it's gone up. Neither do I. In terms of Lebanon, uh, poorer places in Lebanon tend to uh, ignore uh, COVID more. Uh, the, the more privileged are able to get more vaccinated and uh, wear masks and, and practice social distances, distancing. But, um, but a lot of the poor areas, they just, they literally cannot afford uh, to do those things. So, um, so yeah, a, a lot of the time their numbers went up, you know, spiked real fast in, in poor areas. And then, um, and then also, you know, those same areas have now, uh, had more herd immunity just from people getting sick and going through it. Uh, so it's, it's very, it's very varied, uh, according to the socioeconomic status. And Laurie's asking uh, if I could share how the people in Lebanon are doing with the state of the government right now, really the government has been changing a lot, but I think, and I think it can be confusing for people, uh, who are watching globally, but basically my analysis analysts and analysis would be that right now there's just puppet governments that are being thrown up in front of the world stage. There's really nothing that we would call a new power structure that has been in place. Uh, the same governing uh, forces, which are really, uh, really controlled by Hezbollah. So, so there's few different ethnic groups that are, you know, 
that are in charge, but really uh, the main power is uh, is Hezbollah, the Shiite uh, uh, force, political force, and and militia. So their their power is really uh, overshadowing the entire Lebanese government. And so until something global, something big, really releases Lebanon from the power of Iran through Hezbollah, really nothing's changed. Uh, still the same corrupt people in, in, in charge. They're still robbing as much value out of the economy and out of the, the currency as possible. So it's just in a, in a successive layers of, of collapse. Let me give an update because I've been following the news. Uh, those of you uh, who follow the news may know it already, but others don't. Two weeks ago, Hezbollah marched about 400 men with weapons and even uh, rockets and RPGs and so on behind trucks. They got into a Christian area. That Christian area in 1975 uh, uh, was the uh, was the spark of the 15 year war, civil war in 1975 to 1990. So uh, it's mostly Christian, although there are non Christians living there. So the Christians had uh, heard of their intention to come and storm the area, uh, and then march into the Justice Department in Beirut where the judge that is supposed to be uh, investigating the explosion uh, of last year, August last year, and they were objecting to him because they think he's going not to be fair to them because there's a possibility that they may be implicated. And so uh, the Christians, we don't know if it's organized or not organized, there's debate about this, began to open fire on the demonstrators. Seven Hezbollah men were killed and 30 were injured. And they uh, exchanged fire for about four hours. So it was like a, like a war uh, battle for four hours that resulted in a lot of uh, holes in buildings, uh, broken windows and glass and, and injuries and so on. Now, as a result of this, Hezbollah a leader came out on TV and said, we have 100,000 armed men, don't mess with us. And that really didn't go well with all of the other parties, even mm -hmm. some of his allies, including the Druze, who yesterday, the leader of the Druze, uh, said this is ridiculous, that uh, Hezbollah is threatening with 100,000 soldiers. And the Christians, uh, uh, are really, really uh, being bold. And uh, we've never seen as much opposition to Hezbollah as in the last two weeks. Uh, and today the news is that uh, the uh, elections next year, uh, scheduled for March, uh, but they're not final on the dates, but between March and May, there'll be uh, a major elections in the country for the parliament. And there is a prediction that the, the, uh, the, the elections will bring in some new blood, more honest, more nationalist people. And Hezbollah is predicted to lose and the allies of Hezbollah are predicted to lose. So there's been a lot of uh, talk about this in the last two weeks. And I believe that we have an opportunity to pray that the uh, elections will actually bring us some new uh, uh, political leaders whose agenda is not to steal and rob the country of its resources like the current uh, government does, but uh, they want to reform. And there's been a grassroots movement toward reformation and many leaders have emerged from that uh, grassroots movement that started two years ago, October, and is continuing till now. So that's a little bit summary of what's going on. And we need prayer, serious prayer, uh, that uh, the uh, elections will be, uh, will bring in some better people. There's one element of the elections that was debated, whether the Lebanese outside Lebanon 
are allowed to, uh, to vote. Hezbollah tried to block that, but they failed. The government approved that the uh, Arab Lebanese in the diaspora will vote, which means I registered. Christians, because there are more Christians outside Lebanon that are Muslims from the Lebanese. And there are more Lebanese Christians outside Lebanon than Muslim Lebanese. Okay, I'm done. So we've got a lot of questions that are building up. So one of them is from Ken Turian. Uh, how are you handling travel in this extreme lack of fuel? So when my dad and I were in Lebanon just uh, last month, it was really different than 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 the time you know that I had been there before in in June. With uh, the the fuel has just been getting more and more scarce, and every single trip that we wanted to take or any little thing that we wanted to go out and buy, whether it's a little bit of food or we wanted to do this or that or visit someone, we would have to kind of think several times because we had to really ration out uh, our, you know, our fuel. Um, so we would try to hit three or four birds with one stone. Every time we, we go out, we try to make sure to be organized and to get what we need. But um, really, fuel is for the people who have U.S. dollars these days. And um, those who don't have U.S. dollars, are, it's really difficult uh, for them to find uh, transportation to get to work. Um, so a lot of people are losing their jobs when they had any kind of commute and they're having to find, you know, if there's anything else that they can do that's closer to home. But it's uh, it's it's really difficult. And one thing that has happened is that the, a whole black market for for gasoline has uh, popped up. So everybody now has, you know, there's people that have new jobs as black market gasoline dealers. And I think the problem is that those are not going to go away probably after, after there's more fuel available because now they have a vested interest and they already have a network formed for selling the black market outside of gas stations. So just like the electricity, uh, they have a black market basically for electricity. Uh, it's a parallel backup system that they sell electricity for. The same thing they're doing with gas. So it's just part of the, the breakdown. Now, Margaret asked, how are the full-time staff holding up in Lebanon? Before that question, yeah, I, want to, I want to point out that the uh, events, uh, the, the recent events have caused the Arab Gulf states to uh, boycott Lebanon. They called yeah. their ambassadors and they kicked our ambassador. And that's going to put a lot more pressure on the on the good people in Lebanon to oppose Hezbollah because it's all caused by Hezbollah. OK, go ahead. Yep. So how are the full time staff holding up in Lebanon? Baba, would you like to respond to that? Uh, I was there. That? Pierre and I were uh, in September in Lebanon. And uh, I was very encouraged how uh, active our staff uh, members are. Uh, we have now, just to give you a figure, we have 120 people uh, on staff uh, handling uh, several centers and many, many projects, including discipleship, which is the main thrust of Horizons. I, uh, I did training for the uh, trainers. so. My future is to train trainers. And that's what uh, I did uh, on this trip. And uh, there were 40 new trainers that came um, to disciple others. And I asked uh, how many uh, are on, in their groups. And we added them up to 1,588 Muslim converts who are in discipleship, active discipleship, with these uh, 40 plus other 20 that have already been working and discipling. So we have 60 disciplers discipling 1,600 people. And that's been the, the best number we've had in the uh, years since we started the centers. It's very, very encouraging. And I met uh, several of those being discipled, visited homes, and I'm just overwhelmed with uh, thankfulness to the Lord for using our staff who are really actively going door to door, house to house, encouraging people because we cannot have big gatherings. Um, I might just add there, George, um, 
we actually got an update on that 1600 figure it's and right now it's 19 1938 yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i saw almost that 2000 time. yeah i think we should all say hallelujah if we want to unmute hallelujah <laughs> hallelujah uh, this is unprecedented. Uh, I, I, going back to 50 years ago, it was rare to see one Muslim saved, let alone be discipled and grow to full maturity in Christ. And today the story is so much more encouraging. Can How I do ask you, a live uh, question, uh, Pierre or George, or is it um, too many sure. written questions coming? Go up? ahead, go ahead. Um, here in Scotland, we've been befriending uh, Syrian refugees, and quite a lot of them came in through Lebanon and Jordan to, to Scotland. Yes. And uh, keeping in touch with that, we've heard of quite a, a, a lot of uh, Syrian refugees coming to faith in the, in the refugee camps of Lebanon. True. Are, are you in touch with those as well as your uh, Lebanon folk, the Lebanese folks? On my trip uh, in September, I visited two of these camps and uh, they live in dire situations. Terrible, terrible. You can't even imagine how hard. And we, I noticed that uh, uh, the tent roofs are leaking <laughs> and uh, we were coming to uh, winter. So we went ahead and bought uh, tarps, good tarps, because they had the really bad ones with holes. Uh, to cover them. Yes, we are involved in uh, uh, evangelism on the camps, in houses, and they received us amazingly. I mean, our van arrived, I, I was on a team, and the whole camp just came gathered around us, children, men, women, and uh, welcomed us and invited us into their homes, and I visited several of them. And We share the gospel freely and openly, and they are very, very receptive. This is also a big surprise because a big change from 20 years ago when Muslims were more resistant than they are now. Amen. Yes, and so we have a team in Lebanon called Local Missions Team. And Local Missions means that they're leaving their cities and they're going around to other areas. And a lot of the areas that they go to are to visit the Syrian refugee families. So we uh, go by maps, we figure out where the refugee camps are, we go and go door to door in the refugee camps whenever we're permitted to. Some refugee camps actually don't permit evangelism, but whenever we are permitted to go in uh, by the person that is uh, informally in charge of that. Uh, every, that uh, camp camp. Has a, every camp has a leader appointed. So we begin with the leader. And if the leader doesn't want us, we cannot go in. But, mm -hmm. but yep. we have, we have, the two I visited, they were very welcoming. Yes, so uh, it's amazing how, uh, how the, the teams in the past, maybe two, three years ago, uh, we, we, know, you know, we would visit many, many tents, 10 to 20 tents before finding one to two to three people that we really felt were open to the gospel. Um, but we, we would have kind of seasons where we all pray together and think about, you know, are we going to continue doing the wide sewing mostly, or are we going to start focusing on the ones that are more uh, interested? And so we kind of fluctuate. Sometimes we have one team that's doing the wide sewing, another team that's following up with the best uh, contacts that, that, the, that the wide sewing team is finding. Mm. But in the past year, year and a half, we found that uh, so many um, of these tents, so many of these people in the families are, are open uh, to the gospel, that it's really more like seven or eight out of 10. Uh, and one, one staff member said, it seems like every house that we enter, and every tent that we enter, there's, okay. there's at least somebody who's open to the gospel in, uh, in a genuine way. So it's, it's a very different spiritual um, landscape than what we've dealt with before, especially in 2016, 2017, when we were just starting to focus on the Bika Valley more and more. It was tough going. We felt like you're sewing on a concrete uh, slab. 
but now it feels much uh, riper. Feels like God is really, uh, really turning, turning hearts to Himself. And, and so, one, re one reason God, for that, you, you may wonder why there's a new openness. It's that all of these refugees are victims of Islam, victims of the Muslim uh, mm. Brotherhood or uh, or one of these uh, Islamic uh, groups, and they they lost their homes, they lost. Uh, loved ones, why would they want to be Muslim if they have been victims of Islam? So they're much more open. And one exciting thing is when I entered the camp, I had about 50, 60 kids gather around me. They all want to give me a high five. And they were all singing Christian songs in the, in the, in the camp because they go to the center and they hear, they learn Christian songs and they sing them in the streets. So they're basically witnessing through their songs. Mm -hmm. Here, let me continue my uh, uh, question about uh, transportation. How sure. do you, give me the logistics. How do you get your 1,500 people who go door to door? Do they walk? Do they drive? I mean, if there's no gasoline, how do you organize the logistics of so many people yeah. in homes? You know, uh, I'm so thankful that we in Horizons don't have a top-down um, operational strategy. Because if I were to uh, have the responsibility to make all those decisions of how are we going to get this person there and this person there, I just don't feel, I feel my brain would explode. I wouldn't be able to do it. But thankfully, over the years, we have really encouraged a bottom-up field-led uh, decision-making process. So what we have focused on for our leadership development is helping them to figure out how to make decisions, how to gain consensus as a team, how to work out things, how to coordinate. And I am amazed by the amount of uh, just, uh, what do you, what would you call it, grit or uh, resiliency and flexibility and problem solving that, that uh, the team has shown in this time of chaos where you know i only hear about it when it's a, a problem that they can't solve um you know so that so that i can help in the decision making or figure out what to do or if there's a budget item that needs to happen but people are you know our staff and partners are sacrificing personally financially before asking for a budget line item they're helping each other they're supporting their families they're switching the plan. They're, you know, they're finding ways to get things done. And so often the, the, local, um, the local missions team, they start serving wherever they can uh, get to. Some of them will have to go by car or taxi or will actually have the whole van move from Beirut, uh, take a whole group of people, which is much more efficient. If we have nine people in a van, it takes a lot less fuel than if people are driving individual cars, if they have cars. Car so it's been amazing uh, just to see that they, uh, they have been finding solutions in amazing ways. I mean, the Lebanese and Syrian people, they're just so resilient and so uh, resourceful. Um, but, but I have to add a couple of things. One is that most of these uh, almost 2000 people live in a proximity to our centers. So they walk into the center. If you go to the center, Ken, you've been at the center where the school is. It's, it's uh, all day long, we have uh, people coming for discipleship. They walk uh, from their neighborhoods. Uh, the center in Nebika, the same thing. They walk a couple miles and we have a van to pick up those who are older. Now, how do we get gas? Hey, I'll tell you a secret. How did I get gas when I was there? There's a gas station that belongs to an evangelical Christian uh, member of a partner church. And he has been reserving gas for our teams. And uh, three times he filled for me. And I didn't even have to stand in line like most people do. I felt bad about it. But uh, God favored us with this man who's uh, helping us so that to enhance our ministry. That's good. I, I, I like that. Yeah. Uh, we have, mm -hmm. sorry, unless you're done, we have another question from Suzanne, but go ahead, Ken, if you wanted to. No, no, I'm, I'm 
I'm fine as long as you know the, the you have expanded your your outreach so each can make his own decision as long as they have dollars to fight gasoline, right? Yes, yes. So thankfully, we've been able to continue paying our staff in U.S. dollars, and so that has helped a lot with them being able to uh, yeah. to obtain fuel. Okay. Um, so uh, Suzanne had a question about just the farm project and wanted an update for that. Um, we are now in a planning stage of building the ministry center on uh, on the uh, the farm. We're also waiting for an onion harvest to be uh, to be finished from the farmers that had been, you know, kind of I don't know if sharecropping, but uh, had been using that farm. So we're waiting for the onions to be uh, to be ripe so that we can uh, take over and start doing our, uh, you know, our farming operations. And so we've been working with agricultural engineers on how to do crop rotation, how to improve the, uh, the drainage of the property, how to be developing the soil. And then also we're planning to install greenhouses so we can do some vertical farming and optimize the use of the farmland. Because farmland is actually not cheap in Lebanon. Um, it's actually, you know, pretty costly. We got a great deal compared to the, you know, to Lebanon. But uh, you really have to use every square meter of the land um, to, you know, to optimize it. And uh, we're also looking at obtaining more farmland. Uh, uh, so, so we're kind of, ha we have feelers out for, uh, you know, for that so that we increase the, uh, the output that we're going to be able to give. So that's, that's the status right now. Praise the Lord. I've been on that land and I loved it. It has, it has uh, rivers going through two sides of it. So it's very fertile. You guys are farmers again. You're spreading the seed through the word of God and propagating the gospel. You're planting seeds in the hearts Amen. of men and women and you're planting seeds in the ground. We've been Amen. in farming for 25 years in Zambia. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> So in, in U.S. dollars, you know, we did pay uh, for the land in U.S. dollars. And for that reason, we were able to get a very, uh, you know, low price. So what we, you know, let's see what we can do in terms of a per acre price. I need to make some calculations. The property was uh, priced at $850,000. Now keep that in mind, $850,000. Mm -hmm. But what did we pay, Pierre? We paid one hundred and fifty thousand. One hundred and thirty-five thousand. I think it was. I think it was closer to one fifty. What you but... told me it was one hundred and thirty-five. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. So land is cheaper with the crisis because when you give U.S. dollars in cash, it's uh, it's an exchange rate. It's very valuable because of the exchange rate. How do they get dollars? And we get we, dollars we... in. We get by either money. personally couriering dollars in, or we are able to make arrangements with the bank to get what they call fresh wire transfers that they actually give you in cash. They take a small commission. So I think this is a good time to buy more land, uh, Walt. Uh, thank you for asking that. And yeah, that's why we're trying to, uh, to get more land. Um, we don't know whether the land will continue getting cheaper and cheaper in the future, but I think at this point, because of the, decrease and because of the need for a sustainable food source um this is what we're you know what we're hoping for uh suzanne is asking will you keep the current because center even if you build a new ministry center so locals won't have to walk further than they're accustomed to we were just discussing this yesterday me and butros if maximizing farm space are you reconsidering using some of the land for building um i think that we haven't reconsidered uh, using some of the land for the building. We do believe that it's well worth it to use some of the land for the building. Uh, it's not going to be more than 5% of the land that, you know, that we're going to build on. But I really feel that, like Steve George was alluding to, I really can't wait to see the agrarian parables of Jesus be taught in an agrarian situation. I just, mm -hmm. I just... I love, I just love that. It has a special place in my heart where Jesus spoke these things out of a context of Middle Eastern farming, just a few hundred miles to the south. And this is the same uh, thing. I just, I just can't wait for that to happen. It's not just for that emotional reason, but it's because we really want this to be a missional community. It's a community of people that are farming 
and that are growing spiritual things and uh, physical things. Um, so in terms of the, if, if we are going to be getting more land further from the current ministry center, then we actually would consider continuing to rent this ministry center and starting a new one there. But if we're still in walking distance, then we would probably uh, move it because the current piece of land that we have um, is, you know, it is one to two kilometers away from the, uh, from the ministry center. So people are, we're still going to be able to serve that same community. What is the status of solar cells for the farm? You know, you have so much. Yeah. Solar. Is the government still putting huge uh, dollars for any equipment that comes into Lebanon? I heard they ask for $25,000 a container. Is that true? Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, it depends on who you know. So uh, they, they no longer give exemptions for religious organizations or for churches. So that stopped about three years ago because some mosques were, were, uh, were actually uh, corruptly bringing in things on a tax exempt status. So they actually had to shut it all down. Um, but um, so now the churches can't get it either for, uh, for nonprofit. So uh, it just depends on if you have somebody strong at the borders who has, uh, who, you know, who has influence there. But um, we've been looking at different solar cells, different products, trying to figure out which products are, are going to be good quality, um, which, you know, in, in terms of cost effectiveness and everything. Um, so we've been, uh, we've been still researching that and trying to try figure out what we're going to do right now. But we have contracted solar uh, for electricity in one of the buildings, right? Yeah. So we have been working with a few different, uh, a few different companies and um, things kind of fell through with one company. So now we're, we're searching for another one. It's, it's a very much a chaotic situation. So, you know, the staff are, are constantly adapting and, and trying to figure out what the best strategies are. Other questions? Uh, Joseph was asking uh, if the Syrian refugees are still coming to Lebanon or is their situation better in Syria? I think for the ones that haven't left Syria yet, they're staying. They're not coming to Lebanon because things are pretty bad in Lebanon. But for many of the ones that are in Lebanon uh, already, they're stuck in Lebanon because the situation where they left in Syria, they may not have a neighborhood left. It may have been raised to the ground. Uh, many of many cities are just not existent anymore. They're just piles of rubble. And so um, also there've been a lot of reports of Syrian refugees returning to, to Syria and being tortured by the government, uh, being accused of being un, uh, you know, of treasonous or being defectors or people who, had been uh, drafted for the military and ran away from their draft are getting arrested again. So it's, it's a, a real difficult place. They're really stuck between Iraq and a hard place. Okay, that was a bad pun, but um, they are. You mean Iran and Iraq, <laughs> Iraq and Iran. <laughs> well, Syria is stuck between Iraq and, and a bad place, meaning Lebanon. <laughs> And a hard place is the, is the idiom. Uh, so Walt is asking, you have multiple questions for Lebanon to give to. You don't mention how much has come in. Is there a way to know the project status of goal? And need Noah, are you, uh, are you with us, Noah? Uh, we had just been calculating for the Lebanon Crisis Fund how much uh, is, our, is our remaining need for 2022. Um. Well, it looks like, I mean, uh, I'm, I can pull up the document, but I was just looking at it maybe 45 minutes ago. And I believe that for Q1 and Q2 of 22, 2022, so that's like January to the end of June, uh, we're looking at a remaining need of about $700,000, 720 okay. maybe. And the numbers for, the, for 2021 are being published right now. The newsletter just went to print. Yes. 
uh, what, yesterday or, or this past? Yeah, a couple of days ago, yeah. Yeah, a couple of days ago. So that is uh, going to be en route and going to come out online as well. So that's, that's you know, the be full December financial first. report will be there. Yeah, in terms of what was our income and expenses for the past three years in different ministry areas. So yeah, you can you can catch that all. I don't have the numbers on the, on the top of my head. Um, yeah, and so that's um, when we say like for the, that's for the Lebanon Crisis Fund. That is sort of a, an umbrella for a lot of different projects. It's helping with the farmland. It's helping uh, people to like helping us to hire indigenous believers as interns and train them up with ministry and, and uh, career, uh, career skills to build up the church. Um, it's helping with continuing crisis relief, discipleship, food distribution, medical prescription, uh, stuff like that. So um, in terms of the actual list of projects um, in, in Lebanon, a lot of them right now that we report on currently fall under the umbrella of the Lebanon Crisis Fund. So um, it's good to note that, you know, we, we want to do as accurate of reporting financial as we can. And you'll see that um, in the upcoming newsletter. Um, and especially if you're, if you're interested in funding it, we also do have an executive summary that we're going to be sending out to churches and some individuals in order to help cover this need for the coming the next six months of 2022 so um but anyway all that to say um we have some pretty accurate reporting but when it gets down to a project by project basis a lot of it is sort of based on where the greatest need lies at the moment and we have a kind of a budget but um there's always new opportunities arising mm. thanks noah Uh, Dad, did you want to uh, cover that question from uh, from our brother and sister in Scotland? Uh, what's your name, brother? Uh, we've got you muted still, brother. From Scotland. I was there we go. Him. Robert McNaughton. It was um, George. Robert. Uh, I guess you and I met in the 70s, maybe? I, not in the 70s. I, I was over in Rotterdam in 64 and then a few times later in France. But my last uh, actual appearance with OM would have been 1970, I think. Yeah, I started with OM in, seven, in 64, okay. 63 actually, and yeah. went on to 74 uh, officially. And then I branched out to do Bible translation, which started with OM. But then I ended up taking it over. Okay, so, so you... uh, but I still am in touch with OMers. Uh, I was with uh, Paul Tropper this weekend. Uh, Greg Livingston and I are good friends. And George River and I talk a lot with each other. So maybe we met. <laughs> so was, was it in Turkey? In fact, you were working at that time? I was, I was uh, throughout the Middle East, but Turkey was one of them. I began there in 69. Okay. Well, we worked subsequently for about 35 years between Morocco and Saudi Arabia. Yeah, you knew Roger Molstead, probably. I met, Roger came to Morocco while I was there. We met him there for the first time. Yeah, it would be nice to visit you in Scotland and see you. <laughs> Mahababik. Mahababikum. Yeah. Uh, so we had a question. That's wonderful that there's that old connection there. That's so cool. Uh, Bob and Eve asked if we still offer English classes for Lebanese believers as they seek global skills for employment. Yes, we do. Uh, we do literary, uh, literacy classes in Arabic and English. Um, and then in also... Other languages, in other languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes we offer Spanish, French. Italian. Um, yeah, I think at one point we did Italian. I'm not sure if they're doing that right now, but we have volunteers that, that will give different languages. And so, yeah, in terms of global skills for employment, uh, we're, we're training in media production, we're training in uh, web development and apps and, and uh, website development. Uh, so all of that is involving English. And so a lot of the people, they just, they need to work on their English before they can really uh, work on the, you know, software because they, you know, a lot of the software is, uh, is in English. Uh, the programming languages need uh, English language skills. So we are offering those. 
And then Suzanne, uh, do you want to just share your question uh, verbally as well? Because I'd love to hear your voice, unless you're shy. You shy, mm -hmm. Suzanne? Not too shy. I've never known you to be shy. You have to unmute, Suzanne. He's figuring that out here. Clicking somewhere. On the bottom of your picture. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there we are. Hi, Suzanne. Hi. Yes, I've never been shy. <laughs> okay. Yes, a three-part question. Hope it's not too much. Um, with more international staff returning to their home countries, how is strategy shifting for the short term? Okay. And no more. Yeah. And then for the long term. Okay. And then, and then you'll term. you'll ask the rest of the questions now. Um, how about you just finish the whole question because it's sure. a really good question sure. and it's okay. related. I realize Horizons is um, has several highly capable and experienced local leaders in place. I'm thinking of Boutros and Hanna and well Khalil for mm -hmm. now. Um, yep. um, I'm trying to think of all the the list of people. Um, yeah. But anyway, I'm, I know that they are such so hardworking. Are steps being taken not to wear them out? I know you've got to like like hobble them like like tie tie their arm back or something <laughs> slow them down tell them to you go know, like, home i know tirelessly for so long mm -hmm. so yeah yeah and i think i think it's uh that's a really great question and i i love how it just shows your intimate knowledge of kind of a lot of the personalities and the way that we operate in the middle east and, and Ibrahim, so praise mm -hmm, god that like Ibrahim's Ibrahim. back mm -hmm. is healed so he's, yeah he's a Sounds like doing great now. Praise God. Yeah, we prayed praise God. diligently for him for like that what, is so two awesome. years. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, sorry. God is so good. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. See, once we open that microphone, Suzanne, it's just <laughs> like we can't no. <laughs> Love to hear your voice. Um, so yeah, so I think that there's a lot of different ways I can answer the question. But um, yes, I think I think a big part of how to not wear them out is just to make sure that they are delegating, make sure that uh, we're all caring for each other as a, you know, as a family. And so that family care for one another is, is what's needed when we, you know, for us to just detect, Hey, Butrus, you're, you're kind of being a workaholic. Is there something we can take off your plate? And so I've just loved to see, um, People do that. I do that to him sometimes. And I say, listen, brother, you got three, four different big projects on your back right now. We've got to pick one of these to give to somebody else. Which one does it, is it going to be? And sometimes it just takes, takes pushing on that, even though he wants to, you know, wants to do all those things because he wants to make sure you, you know, he's getting it done right. But then just, you know, helping him to problem solve and helping him figure out, Hey, what are the gifts in the team that, you know, can we give this to this other person or this other person? How can we make it happen? And we usually find ways uh, to make that happen. And I really think that leadership, one of the things that it needs is a gap. Uh, leadership does not develop without a, a gap. When there's too many leaders in proximity and they can handle everything, then there's no stretch. There's no... Uh, you know, there's no, uh, there's nothing that forces those potential leaders to actually convert into leaders. So often the fact, you know, the fact that we expand into new ministries so quickly, uh, especially in Lebanon, that is part that that is part of our of our uh, strategy for developing leaders uh, is that we need to kind of sometimes over overextend ourselves to a certain point so that other leaders can come in and fill the gap. And then we also need to just be caring for people personally so that they don't uh, burn out. But um, for me personally, uh, Gigi and I are now uh, here in the US for a year. Uh, we're near Gigi's uh, family. Her, her father's 89 years old. And I'm so thankful that we have those strong leaders locally. Those are people that I can be in touch with. I'm in touch with them all the time. 24 seven on WhatsApp and different things, but, uh, but they are leading yet more leaders and yet more leaders and everything is, um, is adapting and moving forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, so thankful for that. Dad, did you yeah. want to comment on that? Yeah, I want to add one thing and that is the factor of joy, happiness, Amen. enjoying your work. And I see, I don't see one of our staff 
that is kind of dragging their feet. They're excited. They just love what they're doing because it's like a farmer. You're working hard, and then you come and you don't see anything, any fruit. You get discouraged. But when you see fruit, you get energized. And I believe the, uh, the fruit is what's energizing us. And the joy of the Lord is giving us strength. As uh, Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. People burn out when they don't really, I mean, there are, you know, people who work hard and enjoy their work still burn out. But most of our people are not burning out because they just love what they're doing. Even from their home, they're working from this, you know, it's like their life is all about the Lord's work. Pierre, well, how, um, what is the COVID situation and the vaccination in Beirut? Vaccination is in Beirut is higher than in Lebanon as a whole. But uh, Beirut or Lebanon and Pakistan are the two countries that I know of in the world that, that don't subsidize vaccinations. So really vaccinations are pe for people that have uh, $40 to spare, which is not that many people uh, in, in Lebanon. So it's pretty low, the, you know, the rate, but many people have caught it and got a natural uh, immunity. So, um, the, you know, the numbers have, you know, obviously waxed and waned, um, just like other countries. But a lot of people are, are just, you know, being less and less uh, careful about it, just like they are in, you know, in other countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One last question. Give me one or two problems that keeps you awake at night. Mm, that's a tough one. Problems that keep us awake at night. Dad, do you have anything that's keeping you awake at night? Uh, maybe personal things, not ministry things. <laughs> I mean, specifically, we can ministry pray. is exciting. And uh, specifically pray for. If we stay awake, it's because there's so much to do and we're so overwhelmed with the, with the, with the, with the demands. Like on my time, there's so much demand to write this and do this and do that. Um, I I just came back from a 10 day trip to two states. So many people want to get on my Facebook. They wanted my email. My, I told them, sorry, I cannot handle more people than I can handle now. Mm -hmm. So um, I might j jump in. Yeah, go I, for it. No, I, I had had something that I wanted to say in regards to why the Horizon staff are working so tirelessly and how they're just energized to keep going day after day. And then, and also this sort of leads into a prayer request, Ken. Um, but, you know, I, I work in communications for Horizons. I, I work on newsletters and emails and uh, website stuff. And I'm, my, I'm tasked with trying to tell the stories um, that are coming forth from the field um, and, and what we're seeing. And I mean, I can't tell you the number of testimonies that we have received um, in even just the last like three or four months um, from people who visited the gospel Facebook page and were discipled and came to Christ and now want to lead others to Christ or people who were refugees who, uh, you know, uh, came to, to a horizon center and met with people and started coming to a church and then accepted the Lord. Mm -hmm. And, and it's sort of, it's, it's mind boggling to put into context because we might have we might see 50 testimonies but that's only 50 out of nearly 2000 in the last year and when you think of 2000 people actually accepting the lord through in our ministry centers and in the partner churches that we're working with uh and and 1900 people i'm sorry what was it 3600 people coming to the lord and 1900 uh who are in discipleship okay. you know that those are the kind of numbers that it's it's one thing to hear the number, but when you actually think about what each one of those numbers represents, uh, each each one of that 3,600 is someone's individual testimony of coming to know the Lord. And so to get to, to be a part of that in any fashion, you know, I, I, I spend most of my day in an office trying to support everybody who is doing this work and trying to make sure that they have everything that they need in order to 
be able to do it, but I'm just so gratified even from where I am to, to get to see this fruit. And I think that, um, I think for me, especially as a communicator, one of my prayers, uh, my, my deepest prayers is that more churches and more believers uh, in the United States and Canada and internationally would realize what is happening in Lebanon, because this is unprecedented. This has never happened before. And to have people pouring into churches, seeing their, their evangelical churches around them as the centers of their community, uh, you know, and, and places where they receive help and aid and discipleship and guidance and care. Um, this is, uh, uh, it's a revival that the Lord is orchestrating. And, you know, it's one of those things that it's, I think that there's a lot of people out there who, if they knew it was happening, would want to invest their time or their prayers or their money or their, they would want to visit. There's so many ways to be involved with this. And so I just, mm. I really pray that the, the news of what is happening reaches the people that need to hear it because I know that there's a lot more people like Horizon staff members that, you know, hearing stuff like this, like you guys who would tune into a, a conversation here and listen to this and, and be encouraged by it. There's just a lot of people who would be really gratified and really be uplifted and encouraged in their own walk to know what's happening and to be a part of it. And we're seeing exponential growth, uh, multiplication, not adding. Because just two years ago, I was so excited to report we had 450 people in this option classes. And now we're talking about four times that. That's incredible. It's been really a, a dream come true and a dream that's, you know, it's it's beyond what we could have, have dreamed. And just the scale, seeing the scale of, of the number of people that are being discipled, the number of people, mm -hmm. you know, we I remember getting to the point where we had our first disciple who was actually discipling somebody else. And that was just so exciting to get to that point, you know, that second Timothy 2, 2 point where uh, what you've heard in the presence of uh, of many others, uh, many witnesses, you've now entrusted that to faithful men and women who can uh, go on and, and teach Absolutely. other people. At this point, that we're just we can't keep track of the of the generations and how many. I mean, there are just now dozens and dozens and dozens of people who have uh, you know who have been discipled and are now discipling others as well. Um, and, you know, have become pastors, have become pastor's wives, have become discipleship leaders, uh, leaders with their own churches. Uh, it's just unbelievable uh, what the Lord is, ha is, is doing. And this is not a Horizons thing only. Uh, I, I feel so blessed that, you know, Horizons has been so closely a part of, of what the Lord is doing in uh, Lebanon because we've been connected to so many of these churches. But that connection has had a blessing attached to it, not because of us, but because the Lord is uh, is working among all these different churches. So those, what is it, 3,600 people that have come to Christ in the past past uh, year, that's not all at Horizons Ministry Centers. That's, uh, you know, hundreds of those are from our ministry centers and the thousands that, that you know, that remain are really uh, through those partner churches. So. We've been providing humanitarian aid to those churches. We've been providing training. That doesn't mean that we can take credit for everything that the Lord is doing in their churches, but we can rejoice together. I hope that the numbers that we're publishing in the newsletters are, are having that spirit. We're really trying hard to make sure that we're not trying to give the impression that we're Superman here. Jesus is Superman, but we are thankfully, you know, being able to be part of what Jesus is doing through many different uh, ministries and churches, not just Horizons, um, but but yeah, it's it's just how wonderful many, to see. How many partner churches do we have now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really ninety-seven, about, about ninety, yeah, above ninety-five is out of a hundred and three churches all over the country. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. pretty much everybody yeah. except six churches that are in remote yeah. areas. Yeah, I think it's I think it's very exciting, gentlemen, that it's also part of a wider wind of the spirit through the whole House of Islam in in, in the last forty yes. years. Amen. I mean, Algeria, which was neighboring to us in Morocco, incredible, fifty, sixty thousand believers in the last forty years in Algeria and Iran, now the fastest growing church in the world, 
Yeah. It's, it's, uh, oh, kind of yeah. He's part of it there in Lebanon. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd like to add something too, that I was uh, pleased to see that George got to go to Latin America. Um, mm. because, well, I'm an ex OMR also, and I know all these people. He, they're all friends of mine awesome. that he just mentioned. <laughs> Great. Um, but I have, uh, been in uh, Mexico now for the last eight years, and um, I'm working in a, helping out in a church that was founded by XOMers, M Mexican XOMers, and um, it's a mission to the Aztecs in the mountains around. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, uh, I was interested in what happened in, uh, uh, let's see, Honduras and El Salvador, El Salvador. When, when you mentioned that. Because uh, I'm doing a project now that you might find interesting to pass on to these pastors and people who are asking for help, well, to talk to Muslims. But I think they probably need help in um, Bible study as well, especially since some of those pastors have been turning to Islam. <laughs> they must need to know the Bible better. But at any rate, um, what I did, I, I attend a, a class, which is now Zoom, of course. Um, by Ray Mondragon, who is a professor at Chafer Seminary in Albuquerque. And he has been doing an exposition of Romans for the last five plus years. He's just now getting near the end. And I took it by myself to um, transcribe all these um, lessons that he has. And it's in a different format. It's not just straight paragraphs. It's got all the um, slides, um, graphics, uh, pictures, everything that he uses. And um, I, when I got done with it, decided that I should do it for the Spanish speaking world as well. So now I am getting wow. uh, near with translating uh, um, lessons. I'm on 168 lessons. Um, there are over wow. 200. And mm -hmm. I'm uh, hoping to get this done pretty soon. Um, there is a website with all the audio on it, um, their um, seminary classes, expositions, and especially cre creation science. Can you type it for us in the chat? Pardon? Type that. Yeah, for please us do in type chat. that for us in the chat if you get a chance. Uh, I just wanted to take the opportunity. Thank you so much, sister, for sharing that. That's wonderful. Um, it there reminds me of all. Mm -hmm. There was a Go question ahead. by her about uh, the Latin America trip that I took. Yeah, before we go there, I just wanted to say it is the top of the hour. It's, uh, yeah, the top of the hour, many different hours for different people in different time zones. <laughs> um, so that means that basically the official event is over. So you don't have to feel bad if you have to sign off. If you would love to stick around with us for, you no know, longer. for longer, you are welcome to. But uh, just don't feel any obligation that you have to stick around. And thank you so much for all, you know, just to have the opportunity to relate with you all for this time. Um, mm -hmm. Goodbye, Margaret. And uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I, be I believe uh, I was not interested in Latin America until this year because I didn't even think of Latin America as a place for me. But when I was invited and I was challenged that Islam is growing and then visiting Honduras and El Salvador, but continuing until last week even to uh, do Zoom uh, training with about 15 countries of Latin America, uh, I have concluded that if we don't move in today into Latin America, Islam is going to grow much faster. And uh, this is the time when it's still small and we're able to uh, train the pastors to and and the churches to deal with the with a few people and bring them to Christ at least to impact them in some way while they're still small and they're not really clicking with each other too well. I think this is the time for Latin America uh, to uh, the, for the church to be trained, equipped, and to aggressively reach Muslims. So I'm committed to that. My book has been translated to Spanish. We are waiting for someone to guide us to where to print it, who to print it with. But also the curriculum has been translated partially. And uh, I'm working on uh, next year's uh, schedule for visits to the area.
You know, I just wanted to add a quick comment, which is that I don't think there are many places in the world anymore where there are not Muslims present. Really, mm -hmm. Islam has kind of like metastasized, if we're going to use a cancer term. And, uh, you know, honestly, because of the toxic uh, places that it's created in the world, it's, it's left its own people scattered throughout the world uh, to so many different, different people. I think Islam got, got popular, uh, Pali, uh, originally because, uh, because it, uh, it was imposed on so many people militarily that they, for example, when Islam took over Egypt, uh, the Coptic Christians, many of them were able to hold out, but others had all kinds of uh, temptations to become Muslim. They had to pay a big tax for not being uh, a Muslim. It's called the jizya for being a dimmi, for being a, a non-Muslim in a Muslim society. They can't ride a horse. There's a lot of different things they can't do. So there were uh, po political and economic reasons why they, you know, it was better, more advantageous for them to become uh, a Muslim. But then throughout different, uh, you know, so originally the most of Islam currently has, uh, has been uh, spread by the sword, but then also there has been an evangelistic uh, uh, part of it where certain people are looking for meaning, they're looking for monotheism, they're looking for a, you know, for a system that, you know, that they can uh, use to reach God. And so uh, it's a works-based rel religion, and that's attractive to some people because they can just do a prescribed set of things, and then they can feel that they um, that they are going to, you know, that they've done what they need to do. So um, there, you know, that's a long uh, subject. But uh, I think the point that I'm trying to make is that it's Muslims are everywhere in the world now. So we really need to be equipping the church all but, over the world in to be able times, to reach them. In modern times now, immigration is bringing Islam to many countries in yeah. Europe, Scotland, and, For sure. and uh, Honduras. And, because there's so many refugees and there's a quota for each country. So United Nations is spreading them around the world. Uh, and Islam uh, has, has always uh, grown more by birth, by, uh, you know, biological. biological growth than by, you know, by conversions. Sharon, would you please give us your website? If you don't know how to do it, tell us, tell it to us, we'll type it. I'm typing it right now. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> Yeah. Well, God is good, and uh, I hope you're all encouraged by these reports. And uh, I tell you, we tend to be conservative in reporting, because if you end up checking us out and finding us to be deceivers, you're going to be very mad at us. So instead of saying a thousand, we say, well, maybe 400, 500. Um, but uh, but the truth is, God is moving like never before with the Muslim world, and uh, globally, it's uh, it's incredible. And Muslims are leaving Islam without necessarily becoming Christians, in mass, because Islam has disillusioned uh, its followers, and uh, it's not providing the the hope um, that uh, that it promises. Amen. So um, I was thinking, actually, Noah was thinking, he passed me this idea. What if we uh, end with a round of prayer where we just had maybe three or four people uh, do kind of short, maybe one minute prayers and, um, and have someone uh, end in prayer. So Noah, would you like to end in prayer? To be the last person, so we'll let three or four people go, and then so you feel sure. free to just spontaneously go ahead, and then Noah will will close it up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these wonderful news, coming from a place where it's completely chaotic and getting worse every day, but you're the God of order, the God of the Creator. You move hearts and spirits, and I thank you for what Horizons is doing. I especially pray for George and Pierre as they carry this heavy load. I pray 
that you move the hearts of those who are going to be elected as the new government. And Lord, I am sorry, I won't be like, like David with his imprecatory psalms that you destroy the plans of Hezbollah. Just destroy it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, Jesus came to destroy the work of Satan. And so it's, it's a biblical prayer. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you that uh, you have established your throne in the heavens and that your kingdom rules over all. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. You, Lord, change times and season. You remove kings and set up kings. Yes. You give wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So we praise you for that, Lord. I thank you that you also tell us, as David was just mentioned, Mention that the Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates Amen. the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever in the plans of his heart to all generations. Lord, we know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. So, Lord, Amen. we also praise you that you have promised that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Amen. So we want to claim that, Lord. Say not ye, there are four months, uh, and then comes the harvest, as we've been talking uh, about these, uh, the agrarian, I think Pierre said, uh, the, the agriculture project and also the sowing of, of your word, the seed. So lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they're white already for harvest, Lord. Amen. So would you bring growth in both of these ways, especially uh, planting uh, the seeds of, of your word, by the power of the Holy Spirit in, in those so that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in your name to all nations and that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the rivers cover the sea. Amen and amen. 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 Father, we lift up the refugees that have been trained and sent out from Horizons and Beirut and other places, going into various places in the world. We know Norway and um, even Colorado and other places. We ask that you would preserve their families, uh, protect them from the enemy, help them to keep their main focus of glorifying you and spreading the gospel and winning people to Christ and discipling them. Keep that foremost in their mind above temptation to become rich or want their own way or become part of the culture. Um, we ask that you would keep sending missionaries out into the world. People will listen to them more. They speak Arabic and they're, uh, we just pray that every Arabic speaking person will know in Kurdish that they have a job to do. They have a calling wherever they go, Lord, um, and English speakers as well. All of us, Lord, would fulfill our calling. You'd protect our families from, from separation, help, help people mm -hmm. reconcile. Just the basics help us to walk with Jesus, be filled with the spirit and, and not let self or power or pride or prestige get in the way. All of us need to be That's humble, God. Lord, and keep us humble, Lord, and especially these refugee families that are so vulnerable. Um, pray that Americans would befriend them, Norwegians, wherever they are, Lord, that you would strengthen them and not help them not lose what they've already gained. Amen. Yes. Lord, I thank you that you're building your church around the world, not just in the Middle East, but I know that Horizons is in Africa and different places. Lord, our heart does go out to Lebanon, but um, as we've already heard, where there is disaster and catastrophe, where we have to look up. So, Lord, we do thank you for those that are looking up, for those that are taking the training, for those that are reaching out, for those that are helping in communications like Noah and with financing volunteers that are there those churches that are there those people that are sacrificially giving lord we know that you will continue to build your church and lord it's nice to hear 
about those churches and those organizations that are doing your work. And so, Lord, we know the harvest is white. And right now it's good to hear about how just how white it is with so much um, evil in the world, so many rumors and rumors of wars. But, Lord, you are on the move. And so, Lord, we thank you for the Husnis, and we do pray that you would continue to use them, keep them strong. No personal issues at night. Uh, let's work them all out, and we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Lord, um, I just want to come to you um, with everybody here and uh, just thank you for this time that we've gotten to share together, Lord. Um, you know, I, your glory is just so far beyond us. And I thank you that in these jars of clay, Lord, you have chosen to show your surpassing power, Lord. And in these times of difficulty, in this, um, in these shifting sands of circumstance and COVID and economic issues and the national problems going on in Lebanon and refugee crises and uh, division in the U.S. and just all over, um, just international troubles. Um, as we are your children, Lord, uh, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, or persecuted, but not forsaken, and struck down, but not destroyed. And we always carry in our bodies the death of Jesus Christ so that that life may also be manifested in us. And so I just want to thank you that um, you've called us all to gather here today. Um, and uh, I know that there is a richness in the sum of all of these ministries that you have brought together, every one of us uh, working together shoulder to shoulder to see you be glorified and to see uh, your victory take place step by step and person by person, Lord, and soul by soul. So. Um, we commit ourselves to you afresh. We renew ourselves and are, are encouraged um, by your spirit, Lord, um, that, that binds us all together. So we just ask that you would please bless the work um, that we do as individuals, that you would bless the work of Horizons, that you would bless the work of the local church and um, the organizations that support that, the churches, and that you would help us all as believers to be uh, bound together by your blood, for there is no higher uh, unity. So we just praise you and thank you and commit ourselves to you and just ask that you keep working out your beautiful plan and allow us to be a part of that in the ways that you've called us. So we just thank you and bless you in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. 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 Thank, you thank you all for being with us. It's been a blessing. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. See y'all later. Next time. Bless you. Yeah. <laughs> A blessing to us. Bye -bye.